Hey guys, this is Lee with Untapped Potential. Alright, it's time to get back into the daily grind now that all the Starter Deck videos are uploaded. Those were not supposed to take as long as they did, but unfortunately life happens and it gets in the way. But we're back now. So let's take a look. Our weekly quest for this week requires the community to cast 100,000 instant or sorcery spells. Well, that didn't take long. Finally, we have two different archetypal quests which give us the option to play blue-black blue black or to put a bunch of plus one plus one counters on our cards let's just do blue black so the first thing we need to do of course is build a deck last I read the uh, bug of having to create the new deck using the deck wizard has not yet been fixed so let's go ahead and use that to make ourselves a from the grave blue black deck real quick also was reading somebody yesterday who was claiming that even if you have two dailies that use the same colors that uh, they don't it doesn't count towards both so we're going to test that theory today and we'll see what happens our opening pick here I makes me want to take uh, the unholy hungers or the cruel revivals actually why not one of each since removal is always premium and these decks tend to run slow now I don't know how many undead servants I have if I ran four I'd probably try it as is with the stuff I see here, I'm going to grab Corpse Haulers. Get some early game threat going and the ability to get back a good creature later. Necromantic Summons is as good as the best thing we can steal from our opponent. Rise from the Grave kind of fills the same purpose. I don't want more than two of those, I don't think, though, so let's go ahead and pick up a couple Grave Diggers if it'll let us. There we go. Now we need to find stuff to fill up the graveyard, so once again we're going to try to keep a... Uh, early offensive going here with a Screeching Scob, which I only own one of, so let's grab a couple Sky Eel Schools for the late game, and I think two better revelations will also do nicely for helping us draw the cards we need. Finally now we get to round out the deck with more good stuff. This is not good stuff. So we'll grab a two copies of Kite Fins for our late game, we'll put in Meteorite as a way to ramp ourselves, Liliana seems like a sensible inclusion, Separatist Void Mage fills the four drops and is a good tempo play. Uh, Cursed Spirit can be tricky to block, although we are getting very four drop heavy at this point. <clears throat> so I'll take one more Sky Eel School. There's four drop, four drop, four drop, four drop. I guess I'll take this one. Okay, now the game's trying to throw some counter spells at us, so... This one only targets creatures, they cost the same, but it draws us a card afterwards, and let's face it, creatures are the biggest threats for the most part. There's Jor by Merc Lurkers, which I am totally going to jam three of into this deck. Now we're getting somewhere. Reeve's Soul will be good on the early offensive. And do I want Jesse and Thief or Child of Night? I think I only own one Thief, so why don't we do both? Huh. <sighs> Well, I'm not sure it's a good deck, but it's a deck. <clears throat> so we have a 9521. Why is it giving me Rogue's Passage? It's giving me Evolving Wilds, Foundry of the Consoles. This is going to be a train wreck. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> have to excuse, excuse me, I've got a little funk going on in my throat, it sounds like. Alright, let's grab, I don't know, this guy. Let's put him in front of... I don't know, this background seems good. Okay, and from the grave. Okay, this is the part where we go to battle mode. We are going to scrap it out with the uh, AI real quick in a 15 gold hard match. This is the part where I'm going to start overdubbing it in post-production. Let's see how we do in round number one. We go into game one having the very unusual decision of getting to go first, and finding a good 3, 4, 5 curve in our hand, we decide to keep. Our opponent did not have to mulligan, or if he did, he didn't have to go lower than 7. He opens with a planes, but doesn't have any 1 drops. We play our swamp on turn 2 so that our drowned catacombs can come in untapped on turns 3 and 4. Our opponent reaches their second turn, doesn't play anything either. We play Jesse and Thief. We're using this hoping to capitalize on the fact that our opponent hasn't played a creature, and if we get in, we get to draw cards. And fortunately, our opponent does not play a creature. We go ahead and attack here in order to draw first, and then seeing what we get, we'll determine what we do in our second main phase. Necromantic Summons is good, but we can't use it. 
We play a Cursed Spirit as we want to hold back our Separatist Void Mage until we have a target to return to our opponent's hand, and this Amperin Tactician looks like the perfect choice. We play our fifth land here and find both of our revival spells are now in our hands, but we have no targets. We also earn an achievement there. One in, one out. We attack our opponent again and get to draw yet another card off Gestion Thief. We find Evolving Wilds. Of course, since our opponent's in green, here's the Rock Smallers, which I'm definitely not already sick of. We go ahead and use Evolving Wilds to go grab ourselves another island, bringing us up to six mana. And we go ahead and play Sky Eel School, letting us draw and discard. We already have one Accursed Spirit on the field, so we go ahead and get rid of the second one and attack with our unblockable Accursed Spirit for 3 damage, dropping our opponent to 12. They play Foundry of the Consoles here, but they don't attack, which is fortunate gives us our turn. We play Capsho Kite Fins to tap down his Rock Smallers, giving all our creatures free range to attack. Our opponent's wise to this so, and he sacrifices his Thopter Foundry to make two Thopters, which both block our Accursed Spirit, meaning we trade. Once again, we do significant damage to our opponent and get to draw yet another card. Our opponent finds an Evolving Wilds, which they use to find their third color, a Mountain, and then they play Patron of the Valiant, a powerful flyer that would keep us at bay. Would, but it won't. We draw Cruel Revival off the top of our deck, allowing us to kill one of his non-zombie creatures, meaning we can target either. We kill his Patron of the Valiant, clearing his Flying Defenders out of the way, meaning that our two 3-3 three, three Flyers are both able to swing it through the air and finish the game off nice and easy. We go ahead and observe here that it did indeed only count towards one of our archetypal victories. I decide to restart the game here in order to see if perhaps that will cause it to count, as I've had gold that didn't register before but that reappeared after a restart. Unfortunately, no such luck. It does in fact appear to only count them one at a time. Nevertheless, let's go ahead and finish what we started and do another solo battle against the hard AI. We did really well in our first one, we got in real quick, and it helped that our opponent missed their early plays. Let's see if we can pull this off again and wrap this up in two. Our opponent gets to play first this time, and once again we find a perfectly serviceable hand. Our opponent did not, they had to mulligan all the way to five, which is hard to bounce back from. We go ahead and open with a Swamp here so we can play our Drowned Catacomb untapped on turn two, and our opponent finds a Rogue's Passage, meaning they don't have a second turn play. We run out Child of Night in order to get some lifelink going early. Our opponent plays an Evolving Wilds, which they immediately go ahead and crack to fetch themselves a Mountain, so perhaps our opponent's on the Thopter strategy. We go ahead and run out Corpse Hauler and attack, our opponent goes to 18, and we go to a solid 22. We also now have Unholy Hunger in our hand to kill any devastating threats he has, and we have our Necromantic Summons to bring back anything potent we kill. Frost Lynx taps down our Corpse Walker in a very interesting decision by the AI, and we decide to offer a trade with our Child of Night, which he graciously accepts. In the second main phase here, we go ahead and play Jorbi Merklurker, useful for his ability to give other creatures lifelink and for having a big body since we control a swamp. Our opponent makes their fourth land drop but doesn't do anything with it, and we find our fifth land, which is what we need. We attack with both our creatures, doing four damage, and here I kind of screw up. I miscounted how many lands I had. I should have just taken the Child of Night and the Jor by Merklurker. Instead, I take Merklurker and Swamp. I guess I thought I only had four lands or something. My bad. Our opponent finds yet another tap land they can't do anything with, and we go ahead and run out our no another Jor by Merklurker. Here is another part where I probably misplayed. Since I didn't have anything else to do with my mana, I should have given one of my dudes lifelink, but in the end, as you'll see, it doesn't end up mattering. We have a very well-developed field. Our opponent does not. They play Ring Warden Owl, and we decided to go ahead and activate Spell Mastery here by playing Unholy Hunger to kill it and clear the way for a bunch more defenders. This time, I do remember to give my creature lifelink, so as we do six more damage to the opponent, our life total becomes 24. Our opponent plays another Owl, but unfortunately for him, it's still not going to be enough, because what we do on our turn, we play Necromantic Summons, bringing back Frost Links. And since we have Spell Mastery, it enters with two plus one plus one counters. We tap down the Owl, and we swing with the team for victory. Now what's interesting here is even though the two archetypal quests don't stack, our other, two da our other daily, the put plus one plus one counters on creatures we control, that does count. A very interesting development. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up for today though by heading to the store and buying a booster pack. 
Another pack, another mythic, but let's go through them one by one. Aramancer's good in the black-white decks that enjoy playing the uh, enchantments for their benefits. It's also a great way to get back a Suppression Bonds or perhaps a Claustrophobia I mean, if you're in more of a blue shell. Solid card. Ring Warden Owl should be fresh on everyone's mind as we just dealt with two of them. And it's a solid beater. It's a good prowess card. It's it's not amazing, but it's, it's fine. Veteran Sidearm, on the other hand, I can't say the same for that. A 2 cost and then another mana to equip it for just a 1-1 bonus, that's a lot of effort for not a lot of payoff. Maybe the blue-red artifact deck wants it, but I think they can do a lot better. Hey, speaking of better, Chief of the Foundry. Now we're talking. 3 for a 2-3 that gives all your other artifacts plus 1 plus 1. Oh yeah, that's a thing. Really could play as well with Thopters. 1-1s can peck in the sky pretty quickly, but 2-2s two flying through the sky? That's a fast clock. We also find another awesome uncommon here in Sphinx's Tutelage. This is the sort of card you build a deck around, and it really punishes players who are playing one color decks. Hey, I hear mono red's a thing. I don't know, might be worth looking into. And finally, we find Avaricious Dragon. Uh, this one's tough. Four for a 4-4 four, four flyer. That's a pretty aggressive cost, and it can certainly do damage, but its other abilities what we talk about here. At the beginning of each of our turns, we draw an additional card. Great! At the end of our turn, we discard our whole hand. Less good. I'm not sure it's that bad overall, though. You know, in an aggressive red deck that tend to vomit all their cards onto the field really quickly and then run out of gas, this thing works well at the top of the curve. Powerful beater? Check. Refill your hand? Check! Just spend your cards fast, just spend all your cards in one turn. You won't have anything to discard. Ultimately, I think it's an interesting card, and I think it's certainly worth inclusion in some decks, but you gotta know, it can be a drawback. Well guys, that's it for today. This has been Lee with Untapped Potential. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you next time.